words and things like that. In fact, in the name Solomon, you'll recognize the word shalom. You recognize that word? What does that word mean in Hebrew? Basically means peace. So Solomon was allowed to build the temple. And you remember that when Solomon built the temple, the Shekinah glory of God entered the temple. And so the Shekinah glory of God had been in that temple from about 966 B.C. And I get that date from 1 Kings 6.1 all the way till 586 B.C., the eve of the Babylonian captivity. And just before Babylon came against the south, the Shekinah glory of God leaves the temple. And once the Shekinah glory of God leaves the temple, the office of theocratic administrator, which had been restored in a limited sense in the time of Moses, completely leaves planet Earth. And the nation enters a time period called the Times of the Gentiles. The Times of the Gentiles is a time period where the Shekinah glory of God is not in the temple any longer. The nation of Israel is no longer governed by kings, but she is being trampled down by various Gentile powers And it represents a time period after the last reigning king on David's throne, a man named Zedekiah, left the throne. And the times of the Gentiles will continue until Jesus takes his seat on David's throne in the millennial kingdom. And during that whole time period, the nation of Israel is being trampled down by various Gentile powers. And the office of theocratic administrator will not be on the earth from that time period when the Shekinah glory of God leaves until the Shekinah glory of God returns to the temple, in this case the millennial temple, during the thousand year reign of Christ. Um, I should make clear, if I could back up just for a minute, the division between the north and the south The king of the, or the capital of the north was a city named Samaria. The capital of the south was a city named what? Jerusalem. So Samaria is gone. The north is gone, scattered by the Assyrians. The only thing left is the south. The south could have averted disaster if they had gone back to the covenant text, but they actually became more harlotrous spiritually speaking, than the north. And what Ezekiel sees just prior to the Babylonian deportation, which God has to bring. If God doesn't bring it, then he's not faithful to what he said in the time of Moses as recorded in Deuteronomy 28, 49 and 50. I'm bringing against you a nation from afar who will show no respect for the old or for the young. And so... Just prior to that deportation, the Shekinah glory of God leaves the earth and it won't return to the earth until the millennial kingdom and everything in between is a time period when the kingdom is completely absent from the earth. Uh, It's basically called the times of the Gentiles. Where do we get that name times of the Gentiles from? It's an expression that Jesus himself used in Luke 21, verse 24, when he says, They will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles. See that there? That's where the idea comes from, or the verbiage until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So what are the times of the Gentiles? It's the time period between the Shekinah glory of God leaving, just prior to the Babylonian deportation, and when the Shekinah glory of God will return in the millennial kingdom to the temple. It's a time period when the nation has no king reigning from David's throne. The last guy that reigned from David's throne was a man named Zedekiah, And after his reign was over and he was deposed by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, you don't have a king reigning on David's throne. There's no king reigning on David's throne today. 
And that's not going to change until Christ returns at the end of the seven-year tribulation period in fulfillment of the Davidic covenant and takes his seat on David's throne. So that whole time period is called the times of the Gentiles. No theocratic administrator on the earth whatsoever. Hosea predicted this time would come. He says, for the sons of Israel will remain many days without king or prince. And that's basically what's been going on since the time of the Babylonian deportation. Israel has no king. She has no Shekinah glory of God in her temple. And she's basically being bullied by various Gentile pagan powers. Now, that was my introduction. How do you like that? That was a 39-minute introduction. (laughs) Um, That's why I had you turn to Daniel 2. Because Daniel 2 is the prophet that God raises up towards the beginning of the Babylonian captivity to explain this mystery or this new time period that the nation of Israel had entered into. Nebuchadnezzar, you'll recall, of Babylon had a dream and he tells his soothsayers, I'm not going to give you the dream for you to interpret. You tell me what the dream was. How would you like that as a job description? And then after you tell me what the dream was, then tell me what it means. And no one can come up with an answer except Daniel because Daniel turned to God. And only God could provide an answer like this. So God reveals to Daniel this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had of this giant, dazzling, beautiful statue. It had a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. And what it represents are the various Gentile powers that are going to have the upper hand against the nation of Israel during the times of the Gentiles. Daniel sees all of this back in the 6th century and he's able to look down prophetically through the corridors of time and he's able to see what empires are going to trample Israel down during the times of the Gentiles. The head of gold would represent Babylon that would trample the nation of Israel down from 605 to 539 B.C. And you can see in parenthesis all of the Bible verses where you find this. The chest and arms of silver would represent the Medo-Persian Empire that would trample the nation of Israel down from 539 to 331 B.C. The belly and thighs of bronze would represent Greece that would trample the nation of Israel down from 331 to 63 B.C., The two legs of iron would represent Rome. It's amazing that Daniel saw this so many centuries in advance. That would trample the nation of Israel down from 63 B.C. up until the time when Rome pushed Israel out of her land 40 years after the time of Christ, A.D. 70. And there's probably two legs there because most people historically understand that Rome had two divisions, the Eastern Division and the Western Division. And then, as is so common in prophecy, Daniel's vision, or the vision that God gave to Daniel, sort of leapfrogs, in this case, at least 2,000 years, skips the church age, which we haven't even talked about yet, the age of time that we're in now, and goes to a time period after the church is no longer on the earth and begins to describe what many call a revived Roman Empire. So in between the ankles and the feet is a time period there of at least 2,000 years that Daniel couldn't see. And you say, well, this is really weird. Well, this is actually sort of common in prophecy. It's very common for the Holy Spirit to present two events in a back-to-back fashion 
without revealing the vast amount of time in between the events. I mean, this is on all of our cards at Christmas, isn't it? For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. Is that the first coming or the second coming of Christ? That's the first coming. And then second part of verse 6 says the government will rest upon its shoulders. Verse 7 says there will be no increase uh, no end to the increase of his government, of peace, etc. Is that first coming or second coming? Second coming. So Isaiah just gave two back-to-back visions. One the first coming, one the second coming, without talking about the vast amount of time, at least 2,000 years, between those two comings. So it's sort of like prophets looking at uh, what I would call mountains in the distance. Uh the larger mountain, let's say, is behind the smaller mountain, and so you can sort of see the larger mountain raised up, but what you cannot see is the valley between the mountains. That's basically how Old Testament prophets function many times. This was why Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1, verses 10 and 11, that the prophets were confused about their own prophecies. Daniel, many times, particularly in Daniel 12, wanted to understand what it is that God had just revealed to him, and he was told to go his way. It's not, it's not for you to understand. Isaiah couldn't make sense of his own prophecies, because he would receive one vision from the Lord about a suffering Messiah, and another vision from the Lord about a ruling and reigning Messiah, and he would say, well, which is it? And that's why a lot of folks way back then thought there were going to be two messiahs. There was going to be Ben Joseph who would suffer and Ben David who would rule. But hindsight's 20-20, right? Uh, We can look back and say, well, that, that one over there is the first coming. This one over here is the second coming. But poor Isaiah didn't have the vantage point of history. And so 1 Peter 1, 10 and 11 tells us that he was confused about his own prophecies. But anyway, you get to the ankles, and it jumps about 2,000 years from the time of ancient Rome up until what we call revived Rome. And the feet of iron and clay would represent some kind of empire from the, arising from the Antichrist that many call a revived Roman Empire. Uh, I personally think it's much broader than ancient Rome because Daniel 7, verse 23, says it's going to cover the whole earth. So it's the new world order. Uh, It's the one world system of the Antichrist arising from the cultural inheritance of ancient Rome. And that's what the feat of iron and clay represent. And then Daniel, at the very end of this whole thing, sees this stone cut without human hands. Now, what would that stone be? That's the kingdom, which is what this class is about. It comes and it cataclysmically shatters the feet of the statue and the whole thing immediately crumbles. And the stone cut without human hands, grows and grows and grows till it fills the whole earth. And that is a representation of the kingdom of God being restored to the earth. At that point, the Shekinah glory of God will re-enter the millennial temple. Ezekiel 40 through 46 roughly talks about it. The office of theocratic administrator will be restored, and what was lost in Eden is restored at that point. But it's very important to understand this, because the Holy Spirit in Daniel 2 is giving us a chronology. The kingdom will not be established on this earth. It doesn't matter how many churches put it in their vision statement. It doesn't matter how many prayers we pray, and, and how many emails we signed that we're bringing in the kingdom and doing kingdom work. It doesn't matter how many conferences that we attend called Kingdom Builders Conferences. The fact of the matter is the kingdom will not materialize on planet Earth until 
the Antichrist empire, which is being built right now, wouldn't you say? I think COVID-19 is a big step down that uh, road. The whole world is under global control right now. I mean, to me, it's preparatory for the one world system that humanity is destined to go into. But not until that whole one world system runs its course, the Antichrist comes on the scene and rules at least for three and a half years. And these are the events of the tribulation period. Not until that whole structure reaches its height and is instantaneously shattered by Jesus Christ at the second advent, not until that happens can anybody say we're in the kingdom. You follow? So Daniel 2 is giving us a chronology of when the kingdom will come. He's not just telling us what the kingdom's going to be like. He's telling us when to expect it. Don't expect it until the Antichrist empire reaches its zenith and is cataclysmically overthrown by Jesus Christ himself. And so that's the manifestation of the kingdom, Daniel 2, verses 44 and 45. Now watch this very carefully. Daniel 2 through 7 is one of the few sections of the Old Testament not written in Hebrew, but written in Aramaic. Chapter 1, Hebrew. Chapters 8 through 12, Hebrew. Chapters 2 through 7, Aramaic. So therefore, 2 through 7 must form some sort of literary pattern. And they fit into a pattern called a chiasm, which is a strange way of thinking by Western standards, but it was a very common way of communicating in the ancient Near East. What is said in chapter 2 is repeated in chapter 7. Those are the outer edges. And you move a little bit inward into the chiasm, and what is said in chapter 3 is repeated in chapter 6. And then you move a little bit more inward, and what is said in chapter 4 is repeated in chapter 5. So chapter 2 and 7 deal with the same subject, the times of the Gentiles. Chapters 3 and 6 deal with the same subject, civil disobedience, which is something God's people need to know about because they were living in Babylon when this vision was given. They weren't, they weren't in their homeland anymore. So when is it right to tell the civil authorities no? I mean, when the civil authorities say don't go to church and don't sing, when is it right to say no? So I think we need to be studying Daniel 3 and 6 in our time. Would you not agree with that? Chapters 4 and 5 deal with revelation to a Gentile king. The revelation is given to um, Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4, and it's given to his son Belshazzar in chapter 5. Chapter 4 is Nebuchadnezzar becoming prideful and becoming insane for seven years. Chapter 5 is the handwriting on the wall. So what I want you to see is 2 and 7 are teaching the same truth. If chapter 2 is about the times of the Gentiles, then what do you think chapter 7 is about? The same subject, times of the Gentiles. And this is when Daniel sees, this time, not a beautiful statue but four disgusting beasts. A lion, a bear, a leopard. I feel like Dorothy there in The Wizard of Oz. A lion, a bear, a leopard, then a terrifying beast. And then he sees this beast having ten horns. The ten horns correlate with the ten toes of the Antichrist empire in Daniel 2. So the lion would correlate with the head of gold, which represents Babylon, the first empire to trample Israel down during the times of the Gentiles. The bear would correlate with the chest and arms of silver, which would represent Medo-Persia, the second empire to trample down Israel during the times of the Gentiles. The leopard would correlate with the belly and thighs of bronze, which would represent Greece, the third empire to trample down Israel during the times of the Gentiles. 
And then the legs of iron would correlate with the terrifying beast, which would represent Rome. The fourth empire to trample down Israel during the times of the Gentiles. Then Daniel skips at least 2,000 years. And he sees a revived Rome. And he sees uh, that terrifying beast having ten horns, which correlate with the ten toes of Daniel 2, and that's the one world system of the Antichrist, which will cover the whole world, which we're told in these passages, the Antichrist will rule the world through through a ten nation, I think it's better said ten region, or ten king confederacy. And only after that last beast with ten horns runs its course, will the kingdom be given by the Ancient of Days to the Son of Man. So both Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 are giving a chronology. They're just describing it in different ways. And what they're both saying is, do not expect the kingdom of God to materialize on planet Earth until the Antichrist empire runs its course, yet future, and is cataclysmically overthrown by Jesus Christ himself. So Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 are not just giving us an explanation of what the kingdom will be like when it comes, but they're actually revealing when the kingdom will come. Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 are very interesting when you study them. Daniel 2, it's a beautiful statue. Why is it beautiful? and dazzling, because it was a dream given to who? Nebuchadnezzar, originally. And to Nebuchadnezzar, it seemed like a great time period, because he was doing the what? He was doing the trampling. Daniel, in Daniel 7, is given the vision first, and he says the exact, he sees the exact same time period, but he sees it as disgusting beasts, Why is it that what is beautiful to Nebuchadnezzar is is disgusting to Daniel? Because Daniel sees it from a Jewish perspective where he is being trampled on. You see that? So the receiver in Daniel 2 is Nebuchadnezzar. The receiver in Daniel 7 is Daniel. Uh, Daniel 2 is from the position of the oppressor. Daniel 7 is from the position of the oppressee. Daniel 2 is a Babylonian perspective. Daniel 7 is a Hebrew perspective. One a Jewish perspective, another one a Gentile perspective. One a man-centered perspective, the other one a God-centered perspective. One is a statue, one is beasts, one is beautiful, one is grotesque. But based on the chiastic structure in the book of Daniel, both chapter 2 and chapter 7 are giving their chronology And they're revealing not just what the kingdom is going to be like, but when it's going to come. Don't expect the kingdom to ever come. Don't expect the kingdom to materialize until the times of the Gentiles run their course. The times of the Gentiles will not run their course until the Antichrist empire reaches its zenith and is cataclysmically overthrown by Jesus Christ. Then the kingdom will come. Then the office of theocratic administrator will be restored to the earth. Then the Shekinah glory of God will re-enter the temple. And everything in between, don't expect any form of the kingdom to exist. Don't expect a political kingdom and don't expect a spiritual kingdom. And if you can grasp this, you save yourself from so much insanity out there. Because all of these pastors and preachers and theologians and authors are trying to tell you that we're in the kingdom now in some form or substance. That's not what Daniel 2 says. Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 says the kingdom will be completely and totally absent from planet earth during the times of the Gentiles. And don't even think about the kingdom. Well, you might want to think about it. But don't expect the kingdom to come until the Antichrist empire comes first and Jesus cataclysmically overthrows the Antichrist empire. 
Th- think about this for a minute. You're sitting in a church, and the pastor keeps talking about we're bringing in the kingdom through social justice or environmentalism or whatever. And the next kingdom on the horizon is the feet of iron and clay, which is the Antichrist kingdom. Whose kingdom is that pastor building? He's not building God's kingdom at all. He's building the devil's kingdom. And he doesn't even realize it. And most of Christianity doesn't realize it. Because they've never been taught this precise chronology you know, that I'm trying to develop in this particular lesson. There's a lot of people running around that are going to tell you that the stone cut without human hands came in the first century. And Jesus started a spiritual kingdom in the first century. J. Dwight Pentecost explodes that myth by explaining why Daniel 2, verses 44 through 45, has to be future. Christianity did not suddenly fill the whole earth instantaneously at the first coming of Christ. It took Paul several decades before the gospel even penetrated Rome. Christ never destroyed the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire continued to function centuries after Christ left the earth. There, were no, there was no ten-king confederacy covering the whole earth in the time of Christ. By the way, Christ in the first coming was not a smiting stone. He was a stumbling stone. He's called in the book of Ephesians a cornerstone, but never a smiting stone. He's the smiting stone, not in his first coming, but in his what? Second coming. Beyond that, Christ did not destroy all the kingdoms of the world. I mean, the stone cut without human hands is going to destroy all the kingdoms of the earth and grow till it fills the whole earth. Jesus did no such thing in his first coming. And also, we're not in a political kingdom now. The church is not a political kingdom. The church is a spiritual man, a spiritual body of believers. We'll, we'll develop the church later on, dispersed throughout the earth. We, we're not represented by one country. I know that's difficult for Americans to accept because we think God is American, right? But the fact of the matter is Christianity is spread all over the world by the design of God. So we're not a political kingdom in that sense. So here's my last slide. Merrill Unger writes, How futile for conservative scholars to ignore that fact. What fact? The chronology that we just developed. From Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, explaining not just what the kingdom is, but when it will come. How futile for conservative scholars to ignore that fact and to seek to find a fulfillment of those prophecies, the stone cut without human hands, in history or in the church, when those predictions refer to events yet future and have no application whatsoever to the church. So I wanted to take you through that lesson because if you understand the times of the Gentiles, now you're starting to understand the chronology that God has in terms of when he will bring his kingdom to the earth. And you start to see how silly it is for us to try to do it now when God has given us a specific timing. Has anything I said made any sense at all? All right, that's the grace of God. Let's take... uh,